Hey everyone, this is Heather with Young and Savvy Genealogist, and today I want to finish up our mini video series on the Tier 1 tools from GEDmatch. Today I'm going to be talking about the Lazarus tool, triangulation, triangulation groups, and my evil twin phasing. And if you have any questions or want to see my takes on the other three options, be sure to check out the previous video that'll be on that. I'll leave a link both in the cards and in the description. The next utility is the Lazarus utility. And what this does, um, if you can imagine, like the best analogy I have for this is Frankenstein's monster, how he took body parts from all different people and things and kind of stitched them all together and, and made a person out of it. Imagine if you could do that with DNA of people who are, who are living. So what this is, is you're artificially recreating a DNA kit for a deceased ancestor from multiple different DNA samples. And the best way that I can imagine this working, even though looking at it, I couldn't figure out exactly how it works. Like I didn't see a place to input the root kit number that you wanted it to analyze. I just saw the place where you would put in the kit number for a spouse. So I, I couldn't exactly figure out how to make it run. I, how I would imagine you would use this is after you've had one of your parents tested, you may want to attempt to recreate the uh, a DNA kit for a deceased parent. So I just had my mom tested. My father is deceased. If I wanted to try and recreate a DNA kit for him to use an analysis, this is a tool that I could potentially use to do that. But to get the best results out of it, I would not only need to have at least one living parent tested, I would need to have hopefully multiple children tested, and I know that the more children you have tested, the better this is going to run because not all of the children get the same DNA. And I think I saw a statistic once where it talks about like you need at least to, to fully recreate either a parent or a grandparent, you would need to have at least like, it's like multiple children. It's like somewhere between five and eight children tested to fully recreate the missing parent. So the more children samples that you have to work with, the better this is going to work. The more other close relatives you also have, so in terms of uncles or aunts, cousins, you know, first cousins, other close relationships, the more of those you have, the better this is going to work. And you'll also want to have gone through even some of your, the more, not especially distant cousins, but between second and fourth cousins, that you may not understand how they're related to you completely, but you've got them kind of matched out by either at least your mother's side or your father's side. You want to have as many of those identified as possible, and there's quite a few boxes where you can put in some kits for uh, those other matches, um, as long as they are some of the closest matches that you have, because they're going to be the people that share the most DNA with you. I have never used this because I am in the midst of doing a lot of other research projects where this is not a priority to me, but if this is something you think could be helpful to you, know that, that, this, that this is available. I've had quite a few requests to talk about these triangulation tools, and I've never done it up to this point. Now that I have had my mother tested, this is something I was experimenting with, and I have a lot of feelings on this, so this may be the longest point of the presentation. These triangulation tools, the way that they work, there are two of them, and they work very similarly. The first one is called triangulation, and the second one is called triangulation groups. It's basically performing the same function where it's grouping related matches together, but it does it in some different ways, and you decide based on the way that you work, the way your mind works, how much you understand DNA, which ones make the most sense to you, and that's the one that you should use. The way that this one works is it's grouping the related matches together among the your your 500 closest matches in your match list. And anyone who's familiar with GEDmatch knows that you can have on the upwards of 20 plus pages of matches. So comparatively, this is not a very large number of matches that it's working with. 500 sounds like a lot, but in terms of how many you're going to have overall on GEDmatch, it's really not. This analysis takes... It can take up to 45 minutes. And if you're going to do this, do not have any other analysis running in your browser. Do not have any other open tabs. Do not do anything else on the computer except run this 
because it will go much faster. When they say 45 minutes, they are not kidding. The way that this lays out the results, it's going to lay out everything in a table. And if you have seen my tutorial on how to use my DNA matching database, I created a tool in it that would allow you to put your cousin matches together into match groups. This triangulation tool is almost identical to what it is that I created. And I hadn't used it at the time, so you can't say that I copied it. I just, I, I saw the need for how this would work and the way that I've put mine together, it basically functions in the same exact way. You have a root match person on the left and then it shows you all of the people who match that person on the right. And it cycles through all of the different people in your match list and shows you in clusters all of the different people who match each other. And it just scrolls down like a table. Because this is so similar to the utility that I created in, in Access, this is a really good way to get yourself started with that utility. You'll need to have entered all of the matches who appear on the table so that in Access you have the user ID number, the primary key, once you have everybody who's on the match list in your database, you have the separate screen where you put the two primary keys in together for each person. And this it's literally just a plug and play type of list thing. This is something that will allow you to get started with that in access if you're interested in it. So know that that's available to you as well. The triangulation groups are a little bit different. It does the same function, but like I said, it's going to display your results in a little bit of a different way. It's going to, by default, analyze the top 300 matches that you share with the person. And it takes, it says between 9 and 14 minutes, so basically as much as 15 minutes. So it takes a lot less time to run this analysis. And as a result, you can see your matches in two different views. One is the, the graphics tree and one is the graphics bar. And I think the reason why the one particular person keeps asking me to to review this is because she wants me to explain how the graphics tree works and I'm going to be completely honest with you where I'm not entirely sure it's really difficult to read especially on smaller displays because I think what it's trying to do it's it displays kind of like a pedigree chart and it puts everybody in boxes and then links the boxes together and it looks like it reads from left to right and different lines and chains that are together it's supposed to demonstrate like different match groups, but it's got so many links and everything going in so many different directions that I, I'm not entirely sure that I'm reading it correctly. And I think what's happening is on smaller displays, it's wrapping these match lines in, in such a way to where it's really hard to tell what exactly it is that you're looking at. So basically, if you're looking at it on a small screen, you're never going to be able to figure out what it's trying to say. And I think that might be part of her difficulty. So if you have an external monitor, or even if you can hook up your, your computer to a television, I would say maybe do that, and that will give you a, a better bird's eye view of what it's supposed to be representing. Because to be perfectly honest with you, I can't figure this one out. But the one thing that it does that would entice me to, tr to sit down and rack my brain to, to try and make it work is because... Not only does it show you a match group, it provides a little treat icon on every person who has a tree. So this is a really good way to see at a glance not only match groups, but who in the match group actually has a tree available. The one that makes a lot more sense for the way that I think and the, the, the style of analysis that I do is to use the graphics bar. And that's the one primarily that I would use. This is another sort of a table that shows little segment graphics on the right. And each of these are sorted by chromosomes. So just, just run it and you'll it, it's gonna be a better way than me trying to explain it. It really is straightforward looking at it. It's quite beautiful. The only thing you're going to notice likely depending on how many matches that you have is that you're not going to see results for chromosomes one or 22. And it's because those chromosomes are very small overall. You can be talking about a very large segment off of chromosome 21 or 22, but you could be talking about a chromosome segment that is like 20 centimorgans, which can be comparatively small to some of the other cluster matches that you have. So those matches are going to appear further down in your match list, and potentially 
you could run this analysis and not have any matches for 21 and 22. And that's the case with me. I'm getting so many closer matches, I'm not able to see any results from chromosomes 21 and 22. I'm going to talk honestly about a drawback that is part of why this situation is happening now. And the drawback to both of these types of analysis, and in some tools it's more pronounced than others, the real issue with using these analysis tools is the number of duplicate kits that so many people have for themselves. I understand that not every kit that I'm looking at is a duplicate. Some people just put their same exact name on a kit for their brothers, their sisters, their cousins, whoever else they have tested. I understand that that happens. And for every single kit that I think is a duplicate, I run a one-to-one -one analysis on it to make sure that it's not a duplicate. However, I have so many people that are closely related to me that have uploaded the same kit no less than five times, like somewhere between three and five times for absolutely no reason at all. There is no valid reason to do this. The only reason I could even think of is if you've tested yourself with multiple companies and you're just curious or you want to use it as a signal to other researchers that you've tested at multiple companies so they know where to find you. And in that case, fair enough. You know, you do you. But when it's from the same exact testing company for the same exact person, it ruins this analysis. It ruins it. The number of people that I have doing this that are closely related to me is so bad that this tool doesn't work right. This tool works better for finding duplicates than it, does, than it does in doing any sort of meaningful analysis for me. And it is so frustrating. <laughs> you have a potential 300 to 500 relationships that you can look at. And I guarantee you, at least 100 of mine are just duplicate kits. So if this is something that is a continual struggle for you as well, know that this is something that is only going to draw attention to it. It's not something that's going to help you overcome it. And the last tool, and, and let me start by kind of saying that not every tool is for every person. And you, you won't understand what the tool is for until you need something exactly like it. And this is a good example of this for me. The regular phasing tool where I compare my kit to my mother's kit and it pulls out all the matches that are related to both of us, you know, to me, this is perfectly sufficient. Between using that and using my mom's actual cousin list, I, I don't see the need for a whole lot of other type of, of phasing analysis. It's just not something that I need. And, and this is an example of I just don't understand why I would need it until I need something exactly like it. It displays the DNA and the matches that you didn't inherit from your parents. So it's not only a, a type of phasing, it's an oddly specific type of phasing. And because when you run it, it replaces the phase list that you've already created. It took me a long time to do that. I'm, I'm not going to have my phase list deleted just to run this. So that's all I have for you today. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If you like this video, if it was helpful to you, please share it on social media. It helps us a lot. Thank you so much for stopping by and we hope to see you again.